Well, hello again. Uh, in this third um, podcast of this series about wildlife photography, I want to talk a little bit about how you find animals. So um, <laughs> on, on the one hand, that might sound pretty obvious if you're thinking about um, an elephant or even a lion or a tiger, but in fact, uh, or, or a whale comes to that. But in fact, it can be a bit more complicated than it might seem. So um, I'm going to talk about both land and marine animals and um, the kind of things you need to think about. So I'll start on land and um, I'm going to go back to when I was volunteering in Zimbabwe, uh, the Nakabango Conservation Programme, and uh, we had an absolutely brilliant guy there, um, Dean, who uh, was our our guide, and I, I learnt what I could from him. I mean, he obviously knows a huge amount about um, tracking animals, and I, I learned what little I could with my brain. <laughs> um, so they look at something that they refer to as spore. Now, I think that's um, a Southern African expression. I might be wrong there. But spore essentially refers to anything left behind by an animal. So it could be the, the dung is an obvious one. Footprints are another obvious one. Uh, but broken branches, things like that. So anything that's left behind by the animal. And where the, the real power of this is that somebody who knows what they're looking for, so somebody like Dean, can just look at the ground and not only do they know what animals have been there, but they've also got a fairly good idea of how recently. And when it comes to tracking, obviously that's really important. So probably the most obvious thing there is to look at footprints, which is where we would perhaps start. So I was lucky enough to go tracking on foot with Dean. We, we tracked both elephant and rhino. And I also did a little bit of tracking of elephants in Namibia, where, where I'd been a, a few months earlier. And I, if I'll share that experience first. So one of the things about elephants, if you, if you think about them, you just think, well, elephants' feet are elephants' feet. But in fact, they're not quite as simple as that. Because if you look at their front feet, the um, prints left by their front feet. If you hold your hands out in front of you and just spread your fingers as wide as you can, and then if you were to press them into the ground, that's the equivalent of what an elephant's front foot looks like. So the imprint is fairly circular or relatively circular. Whereas if you look at their back feet, they're like our feet. They're much more elongated. So straight away, if you know that, you've got an idea of where the front feet are and where the back feet are and what you're looking at. Now, another hint about how recent the footprints are when it comes to elephants is that they, as I'm sure you know, elephants have um, very highly textured skin. Their hides are quite tough and uh, there are a lot of ridges and things in there. And their feet are exactly the same. And if you think of your own feet, your feet tend to be pretty tough. There's, there's, the skin there is much thicker. And of course, there's all sorts of markings and ridges and all the rest of it. And that gets imprinted by the elephant when they put their feet down. Now, because where I was, we were on uh, working on the edge of desert, we were in uh, dried river beds, those imprints are being made into sand. So when they're fresh, the all those little ridges and um, things from the, uh, the underside of their foot, they're very sharp. But as the wind gradually blows the sand away, they become softened. So when you look at, you could look at two footprints, and if one of them is very sharp and very clear and very crisp, you know that's a very recent footprint. If, however, it's become almost blurry from a photographer's perspective, they, they look slightly blurry, they're less distinct, that's probably that will be an older footprint because unless it's really windy <laughs> of course but if it's just sort of regular breeze going on then that means that footprint is probably a few hours old so obviously if it's a few hours old the chances are the elephant has moved on so going back to zimbabwe when um tracking with dean and, and just staying with elephants we would be looking at the footprints that the elephant had left behind and in fact, on one occasion, so we would we would go out early in the morning. So we would uh, we would tend to do it on our Friday. So Thursday night with the camping out, assuming the weather wasn't you know awful, which it unfortunately was one of the weeks I was there. But on that Friday morning, we would then go tracking, and we'd be out relatively early. And I do remember 
tracking, uh, in fact, a couple of elephants. And as we were just following the tracks through the bush, we came to an area where clearly the elephant had lain down because there was this huge kind of flattened area in the, uh, in the ground and you could clearly see where the elephant had lain on its side. You could see where the legs were. There was even a, a, a very distinct hole in the ground that had been made by one of the tusks that it had kind of rolled over. So we knew that the elephant, at least one of them, had had a sleep there and had lain on its side for a while. Now, as we were going through, the other big thing, <laughs> the less fun thing, uh, was the dung aspect of tracking. So with elephant's dung, when it's fresh, you can imagine it's quite wet, it's quite dark, it's, it's quite warm as well if you stick your hand in there, if you really want to do that. And as it dries out, it, it clearly gets drier, but it lightens in colour. So if you find, I mean, old elephant dung, we would find this quite frequently in Namibia as well, when we were tracking there, it's um, actually fairly light. Um, apparently, if you burn it, it keeps mosquitoes away. I don't know if that's true, but we did have um, just occasionally would burn dung around um, where we would stop for lunch because um, in Namibia, it would get so hot that really that period from around midday till about three o'clock, you couldn't do very much except sort of lie there and sweat and get very hot and sticky. So back to Dean and tracking the, um, the elephants in Zimbabwe, we'd be looking at the elephant dung and as we were getting close to them, it would get darker. Now, the other thing is you begin to see more dung beetles in there. And one of the things we used to see quite often <laughs> were dung beetles and they'd get a ball of dung, they'd roll it into a ball and then they'd be rolling this ball for, I don't know where they were going with it, but over some distance. And you'd even get dung beetles fighting one another to get hold of this dung ball. You know, one would climb on top and try and run away with it, basically, by propelling it with its feet. So it was quite strange to watch these, um, these beetles. And what impressed me the most, if you've ever seen dung beetles, they're quite well, um, they're, they're relatively flat and they seem to be well armoured. But what amazed me was that as we were particularly tracking these particular elephants, as we were getting closer to the elephants, the dung was getting fresher. First of all, there were a lot more dung beetles there, but the species were changing, and apparently there are quite a, a large number of dung beetle species. Now, I've no idea how many, uh, so I won't even um, insult you <laughs> by, um, by throwing a number out, but there's a lot of them. And th th what, what I was observing is that in the fresher dung, they, these beetles were a bit bigger, they were even more heavily armoured, but it was kind of like a party. Everyone was invited, so the fresher the dung was, the more beetles you had in there. So it was that just told you that the elephants were um, very nearby. So that's one aspect of it. With elephants as well, they tend to be fairly destructive. And uh, again, in Zimbabwe, I remember going along tracks. We were actually on our way to one of the local schools. That was the, the Wednesday morning activity. We'd go down and um, just help out at the local school with their vegetable patch or, or um, clearing rocks out of their playing field or whatever. And uh, on one particular morning, we'd seen elephant tracks in the ground and we then saw bits of bush that had been just left as these elephants had gone through. They were breaking off these small branches, maybe stripping leaves, but that you'd get broken branches everywhere. So that was another aspect of it. So footprints are obviously very important. And um, when it comes to cats as well, it's, it's quite different. So the big cats, um, all of them except cheetahs, I'm including cheetahs in there, um, can retract their claws fully as, as your, if you have a cat, as your, as your cat will do. So you can s differentiate a cat's paw print from a, um, a dog, say a, um, a hunting dog or any of the, um, the sort of dog um, family because dogs can't do that. So you'd see a clear imprint, particularly if it was mud or something, you would see not only the pads of the foot, but also the um, the claws. Now, I mentioned cheetahs because they can't fully retract their claws. They're the only cat, as far as I'm aware, that, that can't do that. So cheetah prints are slightly different. Uh, I didn't get to, to track cheetahs um, when I was away in Africa. I didn't see many at all, actually, on that particular trip. But that's um, just something to look for. So I do actually have a T-shirt, which I bought at Victoria Falls, which... Um, shows all of the different um, 
print of different animals that you're likely to find. So that included elephants, lions, um, hyena, all, all those kind of animals. So um, as, we, as we were driving along, I would do my best <laughs> to work out what I was looking at. So Impala are quite small um, and they've got fairly distinctive tracks. Um, yeah, and obviously as antelope get bigger, then the, the, their tracks get bigger, the, the, the imprints get bigger. So I'm not going to try and describe them because um, there's probably not much point because it's quite a visual thing. Hippos actually have quite a distinct um, track as well. I think if I'm correct, I'm thinking it's sort of three toes. Um, hippos are quite strange because they have almost dinky feet, very dainty feet, considering their bulk. But they can move pretty fast and they are one of the, probably the big animals in Africa. They're the, they're the animal that kills more people than anybody else. So they're certainly not to be underestimated. So anyway, that's one aspect of finding out where an animal is. If um, we're going back to another way of finding them. So when I was in India, I was lucky enough to go to India with a few photographers uh, a few years ago now. And India is a, it's very, it's heavily forested where we were. And it was actually the sort of general area where Rudyard Kipling had written the Jungle Book. So I guess technically it's jungle, but to me, jungles, I almost think of tropical rainforests. So I tend to interchange jungle and forest a little bit. And to me, where we were, it was almost like being in England in the New Forest um, in many ways, with um, to, to my uneducated eye, the kind of trees and things. However, in heavy woodland, in heavy forest, um, and also you quite often you had very high grass. So it was quite easy for tigers to hide in different places. And we would be driving on the tracks we were allowed to use uh, in, the, in our little, um, they, 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 they looked like Suzuki's. They were made by an Indian company. I guess it's maybe it's a sort of top and tail effort. I don't know. But these things looked a bit like Suzuki's. Uh, quite small four wheel drive cars, very open, modified to carry, um, to have three rows. So you've got the driver and uh, generally the guide sitting in the front, then you've got two rows of um, uh, people viewing. And that meant that we couldn't just dive into the forest, not that the car would probably would have handled it that well anyway. So we're limited to these tracks. So what we would tend to do, we'd absolutely be looking for tracks on the ground. And again, we could tell whether they were fresh tracks or relatively old, uh, partly by the, the looking at how um, defined the tracks were, and also if anything else had gone over the top of them. Obviously, if um, if you got a track and uh, from an animal and then a tire track going over the top of it, it means that vehicle has obviously gone over the top of the track, so the, the animal was there first. So we would be looking out, but the key thing was actually to listen, because some of the deer there, uh, I think it's the Barasinga, and I'm probably saying that all wrong, but they're a large deer, and they will, they have this warning call, which is almost like a large, bow, a, a large uh, bark, <laughs> it's easy for me to say. There's kind of this barking noise you hear in the distance, and that immediately tells us that there's a tiger somewhere. So we would try and listen to hear if they were moving, but really we wanted to get an idea of roughly where they were, so we could then figure out how to um, get on a track that would put us roughly in the location um, where the alarm call was coming from, and then it became a case of um, you know, driving a little bit, stopping, listening, listening for the call again, then driving a bit further. And then gradually we would be able to sort of get in and um, we on occasion, not every time, but on occasion uh, we would find a tiger. Um, so that's just another way of uh, that um, you can tell there's a predator about. Um, in, in other areas it might be birds disappearing out of trees or monkeys making a, a lot of noise and uh, running out of, uh, you know, moving away, all that kind of thing. So when you're looking for predators, one way of finding them is to, is to track and to listen. And then um, probably the most reliable way, uh, or if, if, you've, if you've got the patience, is to just go where the food is. So um, it, what we would sometimes do, certainly with Dean in Zimbabwe, and, and Dean, I know, has had success doing this, is to just maybe go and find some impala and um, just sit with them for a while. Because if, um, if you're going to get a, a lion... Um, or even zebra, uh, if you're going to get a lion, um, that's that's the kind of animal they'll go for. And um, th you just hang around and wait for something to happen. Uh, in um, The other thing I did, in, in fact, in South Africa, when I was in a, a volunteering there, we went for um, a night drive and we did find some lions hunting. 
and um, that because a lot of these predators prefer to hunt at night um, and um, I definitely wouldn't want to be one of these prey animals so anyway that they're animals on land the other thing I photographed a lot is um, humpback whales so how do you find humpback whales well uh, they're pretty big obviously but they're also they're underwater most of the time and um, that makes it difficult so the key thing you're looking for from a humpback is is the blow which is like a, a jet of steam or a, it's referred to as a spout sometimes but it's more like a jet of steam it's uh, basically water vapor from the breath condensing as they as they blow out and that's the primary way of finding them um, however you, when we were when i go out well watching we weren't just sort of heading out and hoping for the best um, humpback whales are migratory and where we would see them this is both in perth on the west coast and in sydney on the east coast they have a very uh, distinctive migratory um, circuit. So what they will do is in the summer months, in, obviously in the southern hemisphere, so around um, Christmas time, that sort of peak of summer, they're down in Antarctic waters where they're feeding uh, because the water temperature is, is good enough for them. And they feed there. And in fact, the way because they migrate, they actually drive their own ecosystem, which has helped a lot in um, humpback whales particularly re their numbers re-establishing because they were um, hunted very heavily in the, in the whaling days and the um, big moratorium happened in i think it was 86 so relatively recently was when whaling actually commercial whaling stopped um, in theory i won't go into that on this podca podcast but that's another story so as they're feeding in Antarctica, obviously they're, um, you know, they're, they're processing the food, they're sticking it back out again, they're, they're you know, defecating, um, and that, of course, feeds the smaller animals. And it's, it, So you get this circular kind of self-serving um, ecosystem, so it supports itself, and um, that's what goes on down in the southern waters. However, in the, um, the winter months, <clears throat> excuse me that's when the um, humpbacks give birth and in the winter the the water temperature in the south and i'm just going to have a quick drink now <clears throat> i'm getting a bit croaky it's too cold for the calves because if you think of it newborn calves really don't they have next to no blubber on them at all so they need to be born in warmer waters until they can just bulk up and get enough blubber on them to um to handle the colder water so that all happens in the winter months and it happens um in in the north so the sort of kimberley area in uh, western australia and um sort of northern queensland uh, queensland waters in um uh, on the eastern coast so what that means is you pretty much or well, you've got a good idea where they're coming from when you go out so if you're in the first part of the season you know they're coming from the south so what we would do is we'd go out of Sydney Head, so that's the um, the entrance to Sydney Harbour, if you're not familiar with that, but that's just the entrance to Sydney Harbour. And then you're out in the uh, the ocean, and coming out of Sydney, you would basically sort of look to your right in the early part of the season because you're looking to the south because that's where the whales are coming. Obviously, you'd have a look around anyway, and I remember uh, on one trip, I was actually taking um, uh, doing a photography workshop uh, with Weir Observers in Sydney, and uh, we had a, a whale photography trip and we uh, had arranged to get a boat from one of the whale watching companies there, uh, whale watching Sydney. And I briefed everybody and told them not to expect breaches because my experience of breaches personally was I'd see them maybe one every three trips on average. And um, we headed out of the heads and uh, I looked south, couldn't see anything. I looked to my left to look north and there was a, an adult humpback whale in midair about half a mile away. So you have to do that kind of initial scan to see what's what and also with whale watching um, because it depends how early you are if you're one of the first boats out you don't get a lot of help you might have the spotter on land and um, the people I used to go whale watching with they had Annie <laughs> who would be on land spotting um, so if she wasn't out in a boat so we'd get an idea for if she'd seen anything and also other boats tended to share information but if you're on your own you would just do that you'd head out have a look around and then you just head in the opposite direction to the or head in the direction let's say that the whales would most likely be coming from 
So in the first part of the season where they're heading south to north, you just start heading south so that you intercept them. And, and the way that whales migrate is they tend to come in uh, pulses, if you like. So and, and there's around 30,000 whales will go past Sydney in a season these days. So that's a lot of whales, but they're not all together. So you'll tend to get groups of whales traveling together. And then you might get a, a space where there's nothing, no whales at all. And then you might pick up a pod or two. And a pod is simply one or more whales together. Uh, typically, um, we might see up to three or four in a pod. Uh, occasionally more than that, but not, often not those. So that they're the kind of numbers you're looking for. And you're just looking out for the blows. Now, if a whale is jumping up in the air, as I've described, that's pretty obvious to see. Or even if you miss the animal itself, you'll get this huge splash. So that's what you'd be looking for off on the horizon. And um, with the bigger whales, you can physically see them even when they're several miles away. You, you would see the dark shape of the whale in the air. But definitely the splash is a very good um, clue that the whale is there. And it's also that thing about being aware of their behavior. So another thing they will tend to do that creates a lot of um, um, motion in the water is um, a pectoral slap. So, um, sorry, not, not a pectoral slap, a tail lob or a tail throw. And what they do there is they will just splash the water very hard with their tail. Why do they do that? Not quite sure. Sometimes it will happen where you get what we, what's known as a competition pod. That tends to be made up of one female and two males, generally in the early part of the migration, but not always, uh, because the two males are interested in mating with the female. So that's what they, they're, they're doing on the way and when they get up to the north on that first section of the migration. And sometimes it gets a little bit aggressive and you might see some tail throwing going on there. And this is also where if you look at whales, they're often quite scarred and that is often where that scarring will occur. Um, so that's one activity that they're likely to do. You might get petrol slaps. They are where the petrol fins, these are long fins on the side of the body. So they're um, up to a third of the whale's body length. So they're very large fins. Now they might splash them. That won't create as big a splash as definitely a breach or um, a tail throw, but it is another thing to see. So if you see odd splashing going on in the distance, even if you can't see a whale or a blow, Often it's an indication that there, there is, there's a good chance there's a whale there. So these are the kind of things that you look out for when you're spotting these animals. The other thing I will say about whales is that once you have found them and you're with them, the way they swim is they will, if they're just swimming, they'll tend to break the surface and breathe usually about three times and then they'll go down again. And that's known as uptime. So when the whale is on the surface, that's known as uptime. Then we have the downtime when they're below the surface and often you can't see them. And how long they stay down really varies on the whale. So it could be um, a matter of two or three minutes, which is quite common, or it could be much, much longer because humpbacks are capable of staying underwater for quite a long time. So it could be as long as 20 minutes if you have a really, from a whale watching perspective or a photography perspective, a bad whale. And... One of the things that will drive this is how fast they're swimming. And if you think of yourself running, the faster you run, the harder you're breathing. And the same is true for whales. So if they're swimming quite fast, they'll tend to swim quite close to the surface and they'll be up and breathing quite regularly. If they're not doing so much, if they're having a more leisurely swim and maybe just lying in the current and doing things like that as well, um, they might go down for... 10 minutes or so so that obviously from a whale watching perspective that's not so um so helpful and when they're down of course they're, they're not necessarily going to keep in a straight line so this is another thing you just have to watch out for you do when they're at the surface and breathing they actually do leave a, a, a what we refer to as a footprint um, and it's a flatter area of water where they were people used to think it was grease coming off them but it, it isn't because if you think of it uh, the, these whales travel thousands of um, kilometers when they migrate so if they were leaving a, a thin layer of oil every time they came up there'd be nothing left of them at the end of the uh, the migration so it's just where the the um, the water is flattened because of a large body going through it and um, it leaves this sort of footprint so that can give you a clue of how they were tracking where they were going so you've got that footprint on the surface but Whales are pretty bad, uh, pretty notorious at changing directions. So some of them will keep going in a straight line, but
but if they don't like the boat that you're in, they might head out to sea, out to sea a bit further, or they might go inland, they might go under your boat, it might change direction completely. So the thing about whale watching that's different to, say, photographing a lion or a tiger or an elephant is that with the land animals, you've got a pretty good idea where they are once you've found them. Um, but with whales, even when you've found them, if they go down for 10 minutes, they could pop up absolutely anywhere. So um, it's, it's, in some ways, it's much more demanding as a subject. They are much more demanding as a, a subject because you could be with a whale for 20 minutes doing absolutely nothing and then it will breach. <laughs> Out of the blue, you'll just get a breach. And breaches are over in, in less than two seconds. They, they happen very quickly. You often don't know where the whale is coming up. Uh, if they if it's repeatedly breaching, that's much easier, but that's less common. You or you might get two or three breaches. But I've definitely been with whales where they've done nothing for twenty minutes, half an hour, and then we've had a single breach, and that was it. And if you missed it, that was possibly your whole trip gone. So I'll I'll kind of wind things up here, but that was <clears throat> excuse me really the the purpose of this particular just chat to talk a little bit about how you locate animals and it's not always as obvious as you think, and often there's a lot more to it. Um, and, and this is why if, you, if you're going off to watch animals, I do recommend that you learn what you can about their behavior, because that does give you some clues um, about how, what they're likely to be doing in a, at a particular time, so the particular time you go, um, and also the kind of things you're likely to see, so the kind of photographs you're likely to get, and also when you're there, there might be some clues about where they're likely to be and how you can can track them down. Um, usually, uh, the chances are you're going to be go you're going to be going out with a, an experienced tracker anyway, so they would know this stuff. But I, I find it interesting because I like to feel I'm not there just as a passenger and just as someone who um, is there to take photographs. But I like to feel I'm contributing in some small way to spotting the animals. So I hope you've um, found that interesting and. Um, that's it for now. I hope you have a good day, whatever you're doing, and I will speak to you again on another podcast. I hope you enjoyed that podcast. Now, if you did and um, you're interested in wildlife photography or really a basic introduction to photography, I suppose, my next free webinar is taking place on Wednesday, the 31st of January. That's at 7 p.m. Central European time, so Paris time. And um, it doesn't really matter if you can't make the live event because everybody who registers, so once you register, I get your email address. Uh, once the webinar has finished, normally one or two hours later, um, you will get uh, um, an email from me with a link to the recording. So uh, if you're not able to make the live event, if you're in Australia or somewhere else, that shouldn't be a problem. So that's on uh, Wednesday, the 31st of January. And there's a link in the description. It's on Eventbrite. And um, you can also find it on my website. So if you go to the website, you'll find the link there. Uh, and www.ge.photography should take you there. Okay, speak to you soon. Bye now.